Hey, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining us this morning. Um, I'm sure that we're going to have a great discussion here with you know, some, of, some of my colleagues, some of my friends. Uh, we have Jara from Workwhile, uh, Wyatt from Upsmith, uh, Josh Slayton, from, uh, formerly from ECMC and currently with the Homes Corporation, and Ariana Duggan from Interplay Learning. Uh, we're here to talk about the future of skills tr skill trades, and I think where I wanted to start is, you know, when we think about the, the challenges that face some of the skilled trade sector, uh, and by the way, I'm Joe Modi, I work for GSV Ventures, uh, I'm really happy to be here. And I guess where I wanted to st start today was, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges that face the skilled trade sector to help us frame this discussion around, you know, labor shortages, around the quality of tuition, around the learners that are actually in this space. And perhaps I'll, I'll start with you, Josh, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, good to see everybody. I think, I mean, fundamentally, and we'll get into solutions on how to solve this, obviously, but the biggest challenge we're facing in this space is just, it's a talent shortage, right? There is not enough entry-level talent coming into the industry to fill the jobs. You know, I think, you know, there's, if you look at just kind of the three main kind of blue collar jobs around like HVAC, electrician, welders, that's 1.5 million jobs in, the, in this space. And they're turning over kind of 10 to 15% a year. You have a graying kind of work, aging workforce and you're filling maybe 50, 60% of those jobs and kind of that turnover every year. So the biggest challenge as I look at it is how do you get more people into the industry, into the space that see this as a, not just a good job, but it's a good career pathway. And there's multiple pathways that come from that. Perhaps why, if you want to add anything to that as well, I know that. Um, absolutely. Thank you, Joe, for hosting us. And for all you guys coming to the best panel <laughs> at ASU GSV, it's pretty hot. People have been talking all day long about how exciting this is going to be. The skilled worker shortage is the biggest crisis facing the country. The biggest. Critical infrastructure that we cannot build that is core to U.S. competitiveness, that is core to how we think about the future of how people pursue opportunity in their lives, and technology can play a role in fixing it. There are over a million openings just in construction and manufacturing alone. It's going to triple, triple by 2030. In some geographies, we have three or four people leaving for every one person that enters. Really critical parts of our workforce. And at the same time, there is a massive spike in investment that is happening across all domains as you reshore biotech and electric vehicles and supply chains that are core to how we think about a functioning society. So this is a huge problem, huge problem. And so I think the people on this panel that are working on it are doing some really interesting work. And the people in this room, you're here because you care about it too. And so I think the convening that, that the summit does is really important for that. And I'm, I'm excited to get a chance to learn from everybody. I'll also add on to that. Um, it's a particular workforce and type of jobs that's, that's hard to train on, right? You're encountering a ton of variety in the field. Right, you've got buildings that have been in these cities for decades and new buildings being built at the same time with new equipment. So there's a depth of knowledge that you need to have. Um, and a lot of that is hard to train on and is a workforce and set of companies that often aren't used to digital solutions. So all of this technology and investment that is available um, is sometimes hard to tap into um, as that skills, skills gap grows amongst the workforce shortage. And I I think one thing that comes to mind for me here is when you hear about the gravity and the scale of the problem, it's almost system-wide. So you imagine that there will be a role for a government. It's a question of what is that role and how do they align the incentives between employer and learner to make sure that these roles can be filled. And Jara, I know that you have some, uh, you have some takes on what the best way for that incentive mechanism to work would be. Yeah, for sure. And uh, maybe before I, I dive in, I could um, just see a show of hands. I'd love to know who all is in the audience. I see some folks from uh, K-12 education, if you're from that sector. If, OK, cool, cool. What about at workforce development? Awesome. Government? All right. Uh, investors and other? I don't know. Did I leave out a bucket? An important, very important bucket. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you. I just always like to know, um, you know, who, who is uh, in the room. And so uh, I'm Jara. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Workwhile. We are an hourly labor marketplace, and we focus on uh, supply chain jobs. So for us, the, the skills that we see are really um, people who are trained on different equipment, 
machine operators. Um, and we come at it from the approach of how can we, as the platform that is connecting people to work, how can we fund in an ROI positive way the upskilling and training that our customers, the businesses who are asking for the talent, um, to make sure that they're getting the supply that they need. And so we're in a unique position where we sit in the middle of this marketplace where we see workers or learners on one side and then the jobs on the other. And so we have really great clarity in knowing what kinds of skills are missing to be able to connect the two. Um, and so I think that employers and other marketplaces, jobs marketplaces are in a really unique position to be able to offer the right training, offer it right where the worker is thinking about it, because they can see, hey, if I just have this certificate, I'm going to unlock this higher paying job. It gives a lot more motivation to actually invest the time and effort to do the learning and take the exam and get your qualifications. And so I think we, we have a unique perspective at WorkWell from where we're sitting, um, because we're able to see the ROI for the learner and also for our company right away. And Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I want to add on but take a different light. We have a fair number of K-12 people here, which is great to see. And you think about where, you know, there's obviously the government incentives and providing funding to connect employers to training. It's the awareness in K-12 schools on these career pathways. That's a big challenge, right? It's not just, you know, we've created an education system that's really geared towards traditional post-secondary, earning a bachelor's degree, and that's your pathway up. And that works for 25, 30% of the, of the population, right? So how do we, the other 70%, help them identify these great career pathways? So, I'd, you know, Joe mentioned I used to work for a company called ECMC Group, and I see former colleagues here. You know, something great they're doing is called Question the Quo. And it's really questioning the status quo of the traditional pathway and helping people really understand that there are good careers that you don't need to go to school to get a four-year degree. You don't need to get a two-year degree. And you can really you know, have you talked about an ROI, there's the ROI for the learner as well. So as we think about, you know, in K-12 schools, in high schools, helping people identify that there's no stigma around these jobs, right? These are good jobs, they're good careers, they're very well paying, and you can enter the workforce pretty quickly and continue to train from there. So I think that's a really big part of how, where government can play and government, you know, schools obviously can play in a role in helping solve these workforce challenges. And why I think you're, you're working with a variety of different states at the moment, and I know that each of them have different structures. So I was wondering if you can speak to a little bit of your experience working with different workforce development boards in different states at that level as well. Absolutely. Upsmith is a marketplace for helping people achieve high purpose, high dignity work, but we focus on solving a problem for an employer. So we help an employer identify ways to grow productivity that will allow them to expand their workforce in skilled trades. That's our core focus. We've served a tremendous amount of people in the HVAC trade. We've served lots of people in electrician, upskilling. We've focused on ways that you can help to de develop low voltage cabling, accelerators. The core consistency is that when you use competency-based assessment instead of time to qualify talent, so you nodding, we're on the same team here, it's, it's the way. Because competence is something that is agnostic to time. All human beings learn at different speeds. You can be able to help give a high bar for rigor and then help someone unlock an extraordinarily purposeful career that is highly productive for the employer. You asked the question about workforce development boards. I'm certain there are people in this room who serve in that capacity. It is an incredible lever, incredible lever. Oftentimes, though, you are put in a box that is compliance-driven with a set of top-down regulations that are well-intentioned, but not necessarily linked to productivity for the employer. And so the best innovation that we've encountered have been states or workforce development boards, or pseudo public entities who say, I am really focused on productive outcomes. If you can deliver them, we'll invest. And we're seeing right now a dollar of training can create $10 of wages in the same year. In the same year. Just like the taxpayer who's now generating funds back to the state or to our, to our country is paying for himself or herself through productive gains. But you have to focus on the returns and where they are the highest, and they are in areas of great skill. And so the place where we fall down is when we focus on the locus of value being the training and not the job. Because when you focus on the training, um, you haven't necessarily solved the market problem of the employer unlocking productivity. And so there's this what you have to believe that then they're going to be competitive for the job. And it's in that disconnect that a lot of our learners hit a roadblock. Because the power of the job pulling them through is what drives um, resilience, 
It's what allows for them to make planning. It's what gives them earnings. And now I've solved a bunch of problems for a learner that helps them unlock a flourishing outcome that if you start with the training, you haven't necessarily been able to do. And so that's my big, my big ask for workforce development boards or others in the room is like, focus on employers, work backwards from the job that they're creating, and then create flexibility in how you make that investment because the return is awesome. $10 for every $1 of investment in the same year. And so like, that is the way that we help unlock real value from this big investment we're making in workforce. Awesome. That's super helpful and I think a great call to action. Um, I think, you know, I don't know if <laughs> we would be able to continue this panel without talking about the implications of technology and how we see the future of some of these jobs. I think the conversation around government and their role is important, but I think another gravity type problem is one of the one of technology and what it means for some of these jobs. Uh, I guess Starting with you, Jara, uh, you know, I would love to hear your perspective on what you think the future looks like for these roles. Do you think that, the, that AI is a, something to be feared, something to be embraced, something to be you know, othered? Yeah. I, I think it's something to be embraced, right? Like, get on the train, right? It's about to leave, or it already left. Like, catch on the back, right? Because it's going, and um, if you're not on it, then you're just not in the mix at all. Um, and so the way that we think about it is, look, technology has enabled our business, right? The mobile phone having uh, a computer in your pocket is like the whole reason my company exists. We wouldn't be anywhere without the App Store or the iPhone or software. The reason why we're able to deliver remote at your own pace, snackable training for our workforce through their mobile phone is because of technology, right? So we have to embrace that. And you know, just echoing what Wyatt was saying, we launched our, um, our forklift certification through our mobile app about four days ago. We released it uh, general availability. It had been in pilots. It was really exciting. And my team was debating, like, hey, who should we allow, you know, uh, who should we offer this to? Should we show it to everyone or should we just show it to, like, the top workers on our platform? And I was like, okay, guys, this is, like, a lot of content. It's going to take somebody three hours to go through this content. They have to pass a 50-question quiz to, like, get the certificate. Let's open up to everybody because me thinking like the conversion is going to be really low because this is hard. Um, and we ran out of our first batch of licenses in the first 24 hours. The conversion from seeing that this free training was available to actually reading all of the content, absorbing the curriculum, and passing the test was 10%. And this was just like in the first four days. So it was like mind-blowing to me that people were so hungry for this because they also know that once you've passed this, you can unlock a job that pays $3 more an hour. So hundreds and hundreds of people in a 24-hour period were like studying for their forklift certification exam, which I think is amazing. Now, flash forward to 10 years, it could be that all forklifts in the United States or in the world are autonomous, right? It could all be a robotic play. Um, and it's up to us as... Uh, stewards of this working population to figure out ways to train them so that they can become the technicians for the AI robot, right? There's just going to be different jobs, and we have to adapt to make sure that people are trained for those new roles. I'll take a slightly different angle to that question. I think AI is going to make trade jobs even more stable, even more attractive to folks, right? These are jobs that are going to stay in large part, the same, because I, w I looked up, when was this building that we're sitting in right now constructed? 1992. I doubt they've done an overhaul of all the equipment in this building since 1992. So there are parts of these jobs that are going to stay the same, and thus the challenge we have to address to, to what you were speaking to is, how do we make content really engaging, really accessible, to train folks on jobs that have increasing depth to them um, because of the type of manufacturing equipment that's adding new things while the old stuff still remains um, for them to, to learn. And the constant refresh of content, right? You talked about you're continuously learning these jobs, so what they need to know is going to continue to change. And AI can drive, you think about AI driving everything from diagnostics to potential solutions. So how they, these workers can understand that and work within kind of an AI model but then they're still, they have the job to fix it, right? There's still kind of the hands-on component at the end, unless 
we get to that point where it's all robotics being fixed. But I think that's where it's, you know, how, do you, how does AI, you know, I know why it's got some other examples of, of how AI can really benefit this space, but it's the use of AI to help be a more kind of efficient um, solution provider that these jobs, to your point, they become stable. I mean, the need is going to still be there. What that need is will continue to evolve. Wyatt, do you have any? Yeah, I'll, I'll offer a couple of thoughts. So we, we partner with Interplay Learning, and I can't say enough good things about how, how high quality the product is that we can deploy with a learner in, in a job-based training example. But just give you a hypothetical. You know, you're, you're using a virtual platform to be able to content load, and now you have some instructor, but it's more of a coach who's helping you with hands-on tools, get practice, and showing mastery. It's a very similar concept to a flipped classroom in K-12, where now I've learned through one medium, and my instructor is more of a, facil a facilitator. And you're getting a ton of on-the-job experience. Apprenticeship is the oldest time. We're just digitizing the wrapper around that, so you get a ton of survey results, you get a lot of assessment data, and you can show that someone's mastered the competence, and now they're safe and deployable in the field. Imagine equipping a technician who's only been in the trade for about three or four months with all of the insights of someone who's been there for 10 years. It is very, very achievable with technology. And so generative AI is a massive tool for this. There's exciting things that are coming from companies that are working hard in this problem. It also can be very helpful in helping people tell their stories in more compelling ways than they might otherwise tell themselves. So a lot of our, our tool is built on helping capture someone's um, excitement for an opportunity for a career accelerator. We collect video resumes, we then have aptitude assessments that measure non-cognitive skills to say this is a person that you should bet on. And a $10,000 investment in their credentialing is gonna pay off 15X over that cost relative to the revenue they'll generate this year. Imagine if you could help generate scripts for people, telling their story, telling the er examples of resiliency, examples of grit that have come from their experience that are gonna make a huge impact in society as they take on the skill. That's a, a really cool thing to think about with the future of tech in, the, in this sector. You talked about assessments a little bit, and I think that's an important, as we think about the continuous skilling of this workforce, right? It's the continual assessment loop that has to happen to you to understand where there's gaps in their learning and how do you continue to feed them content um, from, you know, Interplay, right? Holmes Corporation, we do the same thing around industry taxonomy. And really that constant assessment along a journey, right? It's not just a point in time they got the training, but you need to know like where, where do you have skills, where do you have gaps, and then how do those gaps match to jobs that are in the workforce, right? So it's the entry level, but also kind of pushing people towards the, you know, their best career pathway um, in the skills, beyond the skills, et cetera, that I think the assessment model of knowing the skills that are necessary that's, that's relevant and current and constantly evolving that has to be a part of kind of this solution around training because it's really that aligning that from entry level to employment and beyond around that industry taxonomy and skill set to know where to feed them into the jobs and, and the training. And Josh and Wyatt have been so kindly teeing up me on the Interplay side. <laughs> For those of you in the audience who don't know, Interplay Learning is the leading global online and virtual reality provider um, for training for the skilled trades, in particular building trades. And we teach content through both video and simulations. So when we're talking about assessment, when we're talking about training, we're talking about genuinely good online training for hands-on jobs. And that's a huge part of the technology opportunity overall. And then when you think about layering on the AI component, right, all of the content and information that is running behind the scenes in those simulations, all the information that we're gathering about the technicians as they're going through the simulations gets 10 x at least in terms of its value and power in the ability to keep fine-tuning the training and the assistance and sidekick uh, for, for those technicians going through. So what was previously on the job, you know, if Josh is my mentor in the field and I need to follow him around, um, learning how to troubleshoot, all of a sudden, in the simulation, there's a lot more opportunity um, to have that mentor dynamic feeding back relevant information to me as I'm going through. That's awesome. And I would, I, I would love to stay on this idea of, you know, ASU GSV is, you know, one of the biggest ag tech gatherings, and uh, the skill trades is one of the largest employment sectors. Yeah, we only have one panel. <laughs> and... <laughs> I guess one of the questions I have is, you know, for aspiring entrepreneurs that are looking at the skilled trade space, what do you think are some of the gaps and opportunities that exist? I think, you know, we talked a little bit about some of the content plays 
but we'd just love to frame up, you know, how do you, how do you see the opportunity for what has happened with EdTech in desk-based jobs, and how do we think about the opportunities that exist looking at skill trades? Perhaps why I'll start with I'll, I'll, I'll lead off. So uh, the not-so-novel insight that I have to offer is the best way to solve the skilled worker shortage is to create more skilled workers. So at its core, this is a sourcing problem combined with a screening problem, combined with an upskilling problem, combined with a deployment problem. Now, there are probably 10 companies to build in that value chain alone, right? So there's no shortage of opportunity. I think when you start with how to create really strong impact from a productivity standpoint and work backwards, you can have a massive mission impact, massive mission impact. And so being a mission-driven entrepreneur who wants to be able to take on a really important problem in a way that's going to unlock a lot of purposeful outcomes for people, this is the place to be. But it's in that value chain of, of how, how do you think about sourcing differently? How do you think about screening people on potential differently? How do you upskill rapidly? How do you help them people be successful and, and thrive in deployment? That's, that's, the, that's the opportunity space. I'll just add that there's, a, there's just a massive tectonic shift happening in the hourly workforce. Um, so there's 82 million Americans who work hourly wage jobs across many different sectors, hospitality, light industrial, supply chain, skilled trades. Um, and COVID has really accelerated their demand for change. No one is going back to being given their schedule maybe two, two days a week ahead of time and being told you have to show up at work at this time. That ship has sailed. No one wants to do that. Office workers don't want to do that. Folks that work in a warehouse no longer want to do that. So there's this huge push to more flex work, uh, flexible labor, being able to opt into your own schedule. There are many ways that you can do this. A lot of companies are allowing this flexibility in scheduling. There's platforms that you can work on. And the challenge is going to be, how do you marry that with the skills development and the career trajectory that people also want, right? How do I marry this flexibility that I require? Because my kid's going to get sick. School's going to be closed. I'm going to have to spend the day at the DMV, right? I may not be able to make it to work. I need to have that flexibility to run my own life while still getting the opportunity to engage in the skill development that's going to help my career move forward. I think that's a huge change and something that a lot of large employers like haven't come to grips with. And it's a huge opportunity for workforce development, for government, and for other entrepreneurs to help tackle this problem and address this massive TAM. There's not a bigger TAM out there. It's 58% of the U.S. labor force. Another thing I'll add on there with the generational shift happening right now in the skilled trades is you've got millennials, Gen Z, and the generation after Gen Z, I don't even know what they are yet, um, coming into the skilled trades workforce who have grown up with online solutions, but the skilled trades workforce is dominantly not online right now, right? OSHA 10 cards are still physically mailed to you, paper, right? It is a paper, paper, paper industry overall, but that's the opportunity with this new generation coming in is more digitally open. So it's an opportunity to take all the great technology, all the possible startups that might be out there and say, how can we take what's running on paper right now and make it work a lot faster for folks who are now going to be even more willing to adopt it? And I think, I think one of the interesting things as well for people considering uh, building in this space is also the to Wyatt's point around productivity and being inherently ROI driven. You know, I think when you think about some of the examples that you've seen across your various businesses, I think it would be great to speak to, you know, how, do, how, is, how, how can you demonstrate tangibly, quickly, the ROI that you're delivering on your training? And Wyatt gave one example, but I'd love to hear from you, Jara. Yeah, so we're the marketplace, right? So uh, when a business post shifts, we get a per percentage fee um, on that. And so for us to fund forklift certification, someone needs to work two shifts for that to be ROI positive. After, after that 16 hours of working in a warehouse on a forklift, um, we're in the clear. We've recouped our costs, and it's all positive gross margin for us, which 
it's pretty compelling. I will do that all day long, right? And that will allow me to invest in other things and hire more engineers and invest in AI that's going to help us generate maybe even better certification content. I put in a plug and an ask for any entrepreneurs in the room that I am a willing buyer of you know, warehouse light industrial equipment training. The amount of time and effort that we spent in trying to find good curriculum to help train people uh, was absurd. There just aren't that many great options. We met with a lot of awesome uh, learning and development providers, but it's all about how to make a presentation, how to learn data science. Um, it was really hard to find compelling good curriculum for how to operate a reach truck. Right? So there's just um, there's a gap in the market here, um, and I personally am not the one to write this curriculum. I am not an expert. Um, but I'd like to buy some, right? So I, it's a call to action, right? That there just needs to be better content out there, more compelling training for some, for some of these skills that are really in need. There's 500,000 open forklift rolls right now that people can't fill because folks don't have the classroom training, which will take you about three hours to complete. The good news, Jerry, you have two people that work on content for the companies up here. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, so. Throw our hats in the ring. Uh, yeah. Have your SVP of sales reach out. No. I am a willing buyer. Exactly. Um, so, I, but I, I do think that's important, right? It's understanding, I mean, you know, we work on, so Homes Corp, we work on content. We work with industry associations to create defined taxonomy content around certifications and credentials, right? So the whole idea is that certifications give the, the stamp of approval in a marketplace for whatever certification or whatever industry you're in. I think it's finding those channels that like, how do you best kind of bring all these players together, right? So I couldn't speak if there's a forklift association, but it's around kind of the trades and how do you, you know, make it industry relevant. You know, I know Interplay obviously does a lot of great work on this in the, in the facilities uh, maintenance space and the HVAC and electrical space. It's finding those right partnerships, right? To your point, there's a lot of pieces of that value chain, right? Everywhere from creating the, bringing supply and vetting supply and the connectivity to the, to the labor force and then that middle piece is the constant training and skill-defined training. So it is, I mean, it's multiple pieces up here on that value chain, and how do you bring that to bear in very relevant quick time? Um, the, the training that people can train, and the R, you talked about the ROI. There's the ROI for the enterprise. There's the ROI for the student, too, or the learner, too, right? They're not going to a two-year, you know, associate's degree, a four-year degree. They're taking, you know, whether it's three months, six months, nine months, and they're in the workforce, right? And we've seen this huge student debt problem in this country. This is part of the reason is we have not kind of channeled people to where there's good jobs and that they can get into the labor force very quickly. I'd love to share an example that illustrates that. Um, and we're active now in 11 states. We're, we're helping solve um, challenges for lots of employers. But a person we're externally proud of, it's a good case study, is a gentleman named Kincaid Beach in Houston, Texas. And Kincaid served in the Air Force, eight years, civilian uh, transition is a little bit tough for him. He's looking for what the right role is gonna be. He has a GI Bill, could go back to school, but the opportunity cost of lost wages and going back is really tough to navigate. So he's working a lot of hourly jobs, unskilled, in construction, and it's not leading anywhere fast. And he knows this, he's a smart guy. He learns about Upsmith and a partnership opportunity we have with ARS Rescue Reader. It's a, a large home services company. $10,000 of training, an investment in him, an EPA 608 license, whole thing happens in eight weeks. He thinks to himself, sounds like a pretty good deal. So our tool is a video-based resume complemented by this aptitude assessment. We go to market on August 22nd of last year. He encounters this, spends Labor Day weekend working on his script. And when he's taking the video, you can see the light changing over the course of the day on his different takes. So he starts in daylight and ends in darkness because he was so focused on how he could tell his story in a compelling way. They meet him and immediately realize this is the guy. So they invest in Kincaid along with lots of other people to go through these accelerators. By November 5th, he's EPA 608 licensed. He's, he's used the Interplay curriculum as a way to build mastery in the skill. He's done a lot of on the job, job shadowing. He generates $20,000 of top line revenue on AC repair in November, not exactly the hot season. The break even was two weeks, two weeks. He's on track to make $300,000 of revenue for the company this year. And he is on the pathway to this very purposeful, lucrative career. They've already promoted him to supervisor. He's only been in the industry for six months. 
But the transferable skills that people have, the grit, determination, capability is massive. And so if we unlock human potential through that, everybody wins. And that's really the opportunity here. You highlighted a couple of things there about, I think, where we find solutions, right? So the company's willingness to pay for that training, right? They see a direct ROI. You also highlighted the GI Bill, right? He has access to GI Bill, right? You could say the same thing about Pell Grants and the ability to use those in non-traditional ways, right? And not being afraid that Upsmith is a venture-backed company that is providing, or, or Interplay is a venture-backed company that's providing this training connectivity to the workforce. It's all solutions-based. It's outcomes-based. Like, if we, we have the funds available, the funds are there, let's unlock them in different ways that makes it available for students to pursue the path that they see best to get to the end state, to get to the outcome that they want. And it worked out great, but there's probably other students that look at that and they can't find the, the enterprise willing to pay for them, but maybe they have the availability of funds or they're Pell Grant eligible or they have a GI Bill. Let them use that funding in different ways than we've traditionally thought of. I would just highlight that today, you know, any of the learners or workers that you're interacting with, they could start making money immediately by opening their phone, <laughs> right? So you just have to think about the pitch. Is the pitch, okay, come to this physical location, sign up for this thing, uh, do a lot of stuff that doesn't sound very appealing for six months, and then maybe you have a shot at, you know, the shining beacon on the hill, or am I going to open my phone and drive for Uber and get paid, you know, $100 in like two hours, right? And so depending on where you are in your life, you can see how the latter option would be a lot more attractive. And what we learned and what we just saw is the compelling thing is seeing the, immediately, the immediate ROI for the learner, right? Like, I am going to do this thing, and then that's going to immediately unlock something for me. And in our app, it's like, it's literally a job is grayed out. You pass this test, and then it's full color, and then you can accept a higher hourly rate. That's the kind of like compelling and fast conversion that I think is necessary to really motivate people. Because there's so many other options that are easily accessible and that work. We've been talking a lot about the direct ROI for a lot of these employers, right? Their, their business grows directly with the number of skilled technicians they have on hand. So that, that line is like right there, very clear for them. That's how they think about their businesses. There's also then this halo ROI, right? These, uh, I, I was at an ABC conference in central Pennsylvania about a year ago. And they were talking about how as employers, they are, their jobs are viewed still as dull, dirty, and dangerous. That's the perception of these jobs. So when you start layering digital solutions that uh, communicate to a potential employee, this is gonna be a really smooth hiring process. We're gonna have an online training program for you. We have a career path in mind for you. All of a sudden, you're also getting this halo ROI of shifting the perception of these employers and, who, and what these jobs are like and who they are as employers as well. That's awesome. And I guess just to, as we were approaching time, you know, thinking about some of the audiences who are here, and I think, Josh, you pointed to this earlier, there are a couple of, you know, big opportunities here, and part of it is a talent problem, part of it is a supply problem. And I guess, how, how do we, as a society, you know, change the narrative, try to increase the attractiveness of some of these roles? Perhaps I'll start with you, Wyatt. I think it's about elevating the status through storytelling. These are builder jobs. It is focused on the most important problem we have to solve as a nation. And unlocking opportunity in this area is one that is extraordinarily compelling, if you can tell that story the right way. We invest really heavy, heavily in video assets at Upsmith to tell people stories. We think that's really important for how you change perception around impact and purpose. And the stigma that has been applied to builder jobs is a great failing, I think, societally, that I'm, I'm gonna guess a lot of people in this room may share that sentiment. And so we can do something about that because we also can select opportunities that are, again, really sexy, really cool. Like working on the future of our electric grid as we make this massive transition is, is purposeful, it matters. And there's a way to focus on storytelling, I think, that can enhance that. And I think it, you're highlighting, I mean, someone, Jerry, you talked about the kind of the flexibility of these jobs, right? You have these careers in many ways, especially as you look at HVAC, electrician, you can own your own company, whether it's a big company or a small company, you can own your own company in, in five years, right? And I think it's, it gives you the, 
the, the ownership of your career in many ways that, frankly, other careers don't. And you know, there's the perception to change among students and people coming up and into the industry. There's perception to change among parents, right? And I think that, you know, parental belief, right? I've got kids. Do we all have kids? I don't know. But you know, you believe that your kids should go to a four-year college, right? And it's changing that perception that you're finding the best path for them, and that in many ways these are in many ways these are great career paths, and we should be promoting that, not trying to channel them into what we've perceived as the right pathway. Yeah. To that point. I cannot tell you the number of customer conversations I have where they are talking about their businesses in this incredibly family-centric way, right? Like, I run this business because it was handed down to me from my parents and from their parents. Um, I, I work so that I can be home with my family. So there's so much there already that just requires a shift in how we talk about it. I also think for those of you in K-12, I know you've got a ton of kinesthetic learners in your classrooms. Like, those are the folks who might be kind of suffering through a, a standard classroom experience right now, but would totally thrive in these jobs because it, they are made for those kids. Um, so I think just recognizing the students in your, in your classrooms who might be great for these jobs and understanding the, the value and, the, and the, the great lives that these jobs provide for folks. I mean, I think it's a marketing problem. Um, like most things, you have to think, um, with them, what's in it for me, for the learner or for the worker, right? It's not, in my mind, it's while I think about, you know, the broader supply chain challenges and how are we going to scale up to meet e-com demand by 2023, um, those are nice things to think about and talk to, you know, your fancy friends about, but if you really want to have impact, you have to kind of flip the script and put your put your shoes on and like go work in a warehouse for eight hours and say, what does that individual need? What's in it for them? Like, oh, I can tell them a pie in the sky story about this class they could take, but like, so what? What's the so what for them? What do they care about? They've got two kids. Maybe they're a single mom. They're really stretched for time. Maybe their car broke down. Now they can't get to the job, right? Like you have to put yourself in the shoes of the learner or the worker to really understand how you're going to communicate to them and build something that's going to be meaningful to them. So for me, I mean, the way that we landed on it was it has to be fast, it has to be compelling, and it has to be respectful, right? There's such a lack of respect for a lot of these jobs. You know, your typical warehouse manager, not to stereotype, but maybe they're not like the most warm and fuzzy person. Maybe they're not, you know, providing the attaboys or the attagirls that you might like that might be more motivating for you. So I'd really encourage everybody to put themselves in, in somebody else's shoes and understand really what is in it for them. What are we building uh, for them and how are we trying to, how are we going to help them, right? And it has to be compelling because people are smart. They're not going to do something that doesn't make sense to them financially or from their time, right? What is the learner or the worker's ROI? That's awesome. And I think, you know, we've obviously covered a lot of ground here uh, from the uh, the role of the government, the potential future in which AI plays in, in this space. But I think what's been most fascinating is hearing you know, some of the areas for opportunity, whether it's from, uh, as Wyatt phrased it, you know, sourcing, screening, upskilling, deploying. I think it's clear that there are opportunities for technology and for people to develop companies that will ultimately improve the lives of others. And, honestly solve a gravity problem for our country, which I think was a helpful way to s for our country. I'm obviously, I'm not an American. We'll, we'll, we'll um, love having you, Joe. <laughs> we'll, let it fly. we'll let it fly. America's an idea, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but for, for the US in general. And I think, uh, I think it's been a huge call to action across the, across the sector from K-12 through to ed tech and also through to the employers to recognize that there are solutions out there that will deliver true ROI, not just for the employer, but also for the person and for the individual and for the learner. And I think that is probably what we should all leave with here. And would like to thank you all for your time, for joining us for a great conversation, and thank my wonderful panelists for navigating the conversation themselves. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you thank coming. you, everybody.